nothing from us. Take and eat. Get your cups ready. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of many sins. Friends, this is the most costly substance in the universe. This is the most powerful substance in the universe. There is no higher price that's been paid than the blood of Jesus for our sins. That tells us two things. That tells us, one, how serious our sin is, that it would take something that high of a cost. And two, how generous our God is, that He would pay that price with His own, His own Son's blood. So with that, Lord, we thank You, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins, raising again from the dead, and Lord, we're proclaiming Your death, Your resurrection, and that You will come again and reign on the earth. Take and drink. Amen and amen. Well, while someone picks up the trash, I'm going to go ahead and open us in prayer and we can jump in. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to hear from you today. Lord, we just want to just say that we love you. We want to, we, Lord, we want to position our hearts and our minds right now to hear what you have to say to us. Right now, we lay our baggage we lay our hurts, our pains, our confusion, our questions. We lay it at the foot of the cross. We lay it at the throne of Jesus. And we just say, Lord, would you pierce our hearts today? Would you deposit anything that you want to put in our hearts today? Would you remove anything you want to remove today? We say, Father, have your perfect will in this place as your will is in heaven. Lord, we ask for clarity, Lord God, for understanding, for knowledge, Lord God. We ask that you would feed us today. We ask, Lord, that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word today, but it, we would be doers. In fact, Lord, I want to just clarify this service, this church, this platform, this sermon, my mouth, it all belongs to you. Mm -hmm. Lord, may I say, Holy Spirit, I just say, would you just touch my lips today and let me say only the things that you want to say, no more and no less. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, um, you know, before I jump into our, our sermon series, I do feel like the Lord wants me to share just a quick thing. Um, I was in uh, worship just, just earlier today, and uh, I, I don't have enough time to get into it, um, but I, the Lord was reminding me of a season in my life that was painful. I guess I could say that. A season in my life that was painful, and He was showing me how he was using that season of pain today as a pastor. And I was just like, I was just kind of recognizing like, oh, wow, that season of pain in my past, like he's using that as a pastor today. And I was just kind of touched by the Lord in that moment. And then I heard the Holy Spirit speak. And he said, I waste nothing. I waste nothing. And so I just feel like, one, that touched me, but perhaps that would touch one of you today or, or some of you today. Perhaps you've gone through a season of pain. Perhaps you're going through a season of pain, and the Lord wants to encourage you right now. He will waste none of it. The Lord wants to encourage you right now. He can use this past pain or current pain that you're walking through, and He can breathe life on it. He can breathe beauty on it. He can use it for His glory. And so I just want, I just feel like someone needs to be encouraged with that. So with that being said, I want to begin our sermon series. We're covering the life and the ministry of Jesus. Let me just give maybe a quick recap of how, where we're at and what really a very quick recap of, of what has happened so far. We have Jesus who is God. He's part of the triune God, the Trinity, the Father. We have Jesus, the Son. And then we have the Spirit. Co-equal and eternal. Three separate persons, one God. And so we're covering the life and ministry of Jesus, but really, Jesus actually doesn't have a starting point because He's God. In fact, in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And Jesus is the Word. And so we learn from John chapter 1 that Jesus was before, before creation, right? Jesus was there. And so we, we're covering the life of Jesus. I think it's appropriate to say that Jesus is eternal. He's always existed, and he was here before creation. 
Then we learn in, in further on in the John chapter 1 that it was actually through Jesus that everything was created. And that through Jesus, everything is held together. And so we have Jesus who has always been, who is, and in, in fact, we also learn in one of Jesus's prayers to the Father, he said, Father, uh, he, he, ref, he referred to the glory that the Son and the Father shared before creation. So we have Jesus being eternal, being God, and sharing glory within himself, within the triune God, before creation began. And then we have creation, which Jesus was very well a part of. And then fast forward thousands and thousands of years later, God says it's time and sends his son to the earth. And so we have Jesus setting his glory aside and putting on human skin, putting on flesh, becoming a human. And Jesus is unique because not he's fully God, yet he's fully man at the same time. Well, how does that work? Well, he's God. He could do whatever he wants. I don't fully understand the mechanics of that, but that's, that's how Scripture lays it out. And so we have Jesus fully God and fully man. And well, how do we know he's fully man? Because we see Jesus got tired. We see J Jesus wept. We saw Jesus was hungry and he ate. So Jesus had real hum humanity that he walked through. And we're actually going to see that tonight in the garden. And so leading up, so Jesus is born. He's raised by a, a family, Mary and Joseph. Somewhere along the line, Joseph dies, and he's in, in a single mom's household. And he's not really loved very well by his brothers. Uh, and I think there's a sister in there. We don't know how many there are, but he's not loved by his, his siblings. And now Jesus is, is just about to finish. He's been in three years of ministry. He's been preaching to the multitudes. He's been rebuking the religious leaders. And he's been discipling and training up the first leaders, the, the future leaders of his church, his, his 12 disciples, which one of them is going to betray him today. We're going to go over uh, the, one of the Jesus's greatest betrayals is by one of his closest friends named Judas. And so this is where we find ourselves. Now, why are we studying the life of Jesus? I would say this. If there's any area as a believer that we should be an expert on, it should be on, an expertise on Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is really clear when he dies and he raises again from the dead and, and he's with his disciples and he's with people, his followers for about 40 days, he opens the scriptures to him and he shows them, hey, look, guys, look at all, and all, which would be our Old Testament today. And he's saying, look, guys, everything pertains to me. Everything in your Bible has to do with me. And so Jesus is the key to understanding our scriptures. Jesus is the key to understanding our faith. In fact, we are the Christianity is the most divided religion on the face of the earth. We are more divided than any other religion. That's embarrassing. And the way that we we can achieve unity in the body of Christ is through Jesus, because Jesus is perfect theology. You can't get Jesus wrong. You can't get Jesus wrong. And so um, we are we want to become experts on the life of Jesus. And last, I'll say this: Why are we studying Jesus? Because have you ever wanted to know what God is like? Have you ever wanted to know what he thinks, how he feels, how he reacts to certain situations? Well, we actually get to know that, one, by reading his word, but two, by looking into the life of Jesus. Because Jesus said, I only do what the Father does. I only say what the Father says. Jesus was in full submission to the Father's perfect will. So if you want to get a really good look of God, get a good look at Jesus. And you get to know who God is. And so with that being said... Let me pull my notes up. We covered last week Jesus' last supper in the upper room, okay? And, and we hear some of Jesus' final words before he will have to go to the cross. He teaches on leadership, right? He teaches on the importance of faith. He gives the disciples a new strategy for the days ahead. And so this week... We are going to move on into the garden. Jesus leaves the upper room, takes his disciples to the garden of Gethsemane, which is on the Mount of Olives. And we're going to, we're going to spend our time in the garden today. And in this garden, Jesus is going to, he's going to pray. He's going to be betrayed by one of his closest friends, Judas, and he's going to be arrested. Okay, so, you know, before I jump into to the garden, I think it's kind of interesting that we see our, our biggest loss 
as a human race is in the Garden of Eden. And then our, our biggest win, one of our biggest wins is in another garden called Gethsemane. So I just think, I don't think this is by accident that we find this moment here that we're talking about today. This moment in Jesus's life also happens in a garden. Why do we see that? One, because God is poetic. He's not only a creator. He's not only a builder. He's not only a man of war. He is a poet and he's creative. He's an artist. So I think one, that's the poetry of God. Two, it's also the redemptive work of God. God is a redeemer. And so we find ourselves in this garden called Gethsemane. What, let me just real quick recap. In the upper room, we see Satan enter Judas. And Judas leaves to betray Jesus. We see Jesus wrap things up in the, in the upper room and then leave to the Mount of Olives, which is what they typically did during the, this time in Jerusalem, during this season, the short season. Jesus and his disciples would go into Jerusalem. They would teach all day, and then they would have their home base just right outside the city on the Mount of Olives. You can actually see Jerusalem. You can see the Dome of the Rock, which is where the temple used to be. You can see that from the Mount of Olives easily. In fact, there are houses on this house uh, on this mountain today. Like people literally live on the Mount of Olives. Can you imagine? Okay. By the way, this is where Jesus's feet are going to touch down when he returns. He's going to touch down on that mountain. Okay. So Jesus would have this 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 practice, they would go into Jerusalem and they go back to the Mount of Olives. Now, Bethany is on the Mount of Olives. Bethany is where Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived, very close friends of Jesus. It's likely that they probably had their home base at their house. And there was a garden on this mountain. I say mountain, it's really a hill, but they call it the Mount of Olives. And there was a garden there called the Garden of Gethsemane. In fact, there are olive trees still in this garden today. Now, how old they are, I don't know. Are they as old? But they're like, I mean, they're ancient looking. They're massive. Um, very powerful. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 22 today, by the way. We, we'll jump around to different gospel accounts, but majority time we'll be spending in Luke chapter 22. I'm reading of the New King James Version, if you're curious. Uh, and here we go. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 46. We'll start out with coming out. So this, this means coming out of the upper room, coming out. He went, this is Jesus, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. Verse 40, when he came to the place, okay, so we're in Luke, Matthew actually names the place. Matthew names the place the Garden of Gethsemane, okay? When he came to the place, this is the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to them, okay, so they enter into this garden and Jesus gives them instructions. He says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. So they they were they could see Jesus. They could see what Jesus was doing. A stone's throw, maybe they even heard Jesus praying, but Jesus was alone privately praying. In fact, other gospel accounts will uh, tell us that Peter, James, and John were actually closer to Jesus where he was praying, and the rest of the group was further away. And this is something that we see. Jesus had identified Peter, James, and John as the inner three of the 12 disciples, and he was pouring into them. And so verse 41, or sorry, 42, saying, so he knelt, knelt down and he prays, and this is what Jesus prayed, 42, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You need to understand what Jesus is saying in this prayer. Jesus is fully aware of what this cup means. When he says this cup, he means your plan. Father, can this plan pass for me? Can we go with another plan? Because this plan is not very comfortable for me. Why? Jesus knows what's going to happen. He knows that he's going to... No, let's, first of all, he's going to be brutally tortured and murdered. Brutally. He's going to be mocked. He's going to have his beard pulled from his face. As it says in some of, uh, some of the... Um, uh, Old Testament prophecies. He's not going to be recognizable as a man. He's literally not going to look human after the beatings that he goes through. He's going to be whipped within an inch of his life, and then he's going to hang on a cross and die. So obviously that doesn't sound fun. Perhaps he's praying for that cup to pass, but he's praying for something that's far harder than the torture, than the physical part. He's He is praying for the spiritual part, especially the past. Why? Because Jesus is about to take on the sins of mankind. He is going to pay 
for the sins of mankind. And if he is going to pay for the sins, he also has to serve the sentence. What's the sentence? The wrath of God. Jesus is going to literally take on the entire wrath of God for the sins of the human race. And not only is he going to take the wrath of God, he's part of the punishment is separation from God. This is what hell is. Hell is separation from God. This is why hell is hell, because God, in God we have light and life and happiness and joy and peace. In fact, non-believers actually get to experience pieces of God because God has not separated the human race from himself. But when the time comes when he judges the living and the dead, he's going to separate us between believers and non-believers, believers living with him for eternity, non-believers getting what they want separation from God. They want nothing to do with God. They've not received Jesus as their son. They don't want to serve God. And so God says, okay, if you don't want to be with me, you're going to be without me. And the, and that is called hell. That's why hell is, is torment. That's why hell is a lake of fire and burning. And like all of this imagery that we read, it's because God's not there. And God's not going to, because remember, God is all about being a God of, of letting mankind choose and free will. And so he's going to let mankind choose where they want to end up. And he would never force someone to be in a place for eternity that they don't want to be in, which is in perfect unity with God. And so Jesus is going, okay, I know the plan. I know the cup. Is there another plan? Is there another way? But then he says, not my will, your will be done, Father. This is a, You have to understand, this is a massive prayer. This is a massive moment in the ministry of Jesus. Okay, so he's praying, verse 43, and it says this, Then an angel appeared to him from heaven. So an angel appears to Jesus from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, so Jesus being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Okay, let's talk about that. Sweating drops of blood. What is that, Justin? That's actually a rare medical condition. A proven, real medical dish condition, and it has a name. So what, uh, it's it's uh, the National Library of Medicine, which is a government website. It's .gov. It says this. The, the, the condition is called hematohydrosis. That is a mouthful. Hematohydrosis. And it's known by two different names. One is shorter than the other, but the, the more longer one is hematohydrosis. National Library of Medicine says this. Hematohydrosis is a very rare condition in which an individual sweats blood. It may occur in an, uh, in an individual who is suffering from extreme levels of stress. WebMD says this, only a, few, only a few hundreds, sorry, let me back up, only a few handfuls of hematohydrosis cases were confirmed in medical studies in the 20th century. So not only is this a rare blood thing, it's only been a handful of cases that they've discovered in the 20th century. So it's very rare. This would tell me that you got to be under extreme, extreme levels of stress that only a few people understand. And this is what Jesus is under. Jesus is not fearful because fear is from the enemy, but Jesus is under stress because he knows separation from the Father. He's never known this. The Godhead has never known separation. The, the God needs none of us. God doesn't need creation. God doesn't need humanity. He has full community within himself. He, he, can, he can fully experience and, and, and leverage his love, right? Because he's a God of love. He can fully experience love and leverage love within himself. Perfect community. God has never known separation from himself like this. So Jesus is under extreme stress. Think about this, guys. Think of, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This is a new thing. This is a big deal. So Jesus is sweating blood. You know, Samantha uh, shared with me a really cool story. She was awesome revelation. She was in prayer one morning, and she was contemplating Jesus in the garden and his suffering and his sacrifice for us, and she was just thanking the Lord and she heard the Holy Spirit say, the blood started in the garden. And I just thought, that's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool revelation. The blood of Jesus started in the garden. Okay, verse 45, when he rose up from prayer, 
and had to come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Remember that, sleeping from sorrow. Verse 46, then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. So let's talk about that, sleeping from sorrow. Other gospel accounts say that their eyes are heavy, so they're tired. But this gospel account in Luke shares that they are sleeping because of their sorrow. Guys, their life, the disciples' lives are falling apart right now. Why? They just experienced a triumphal entry with Jesus the Messiah. They have been waiting. The, 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 the Jews have been waiting for the Messiah to come. And this triumphal entry, people, people are, are throwing palm branches in the streets. They're throwing their cloaks out in the streets. And they're saying, Hosea, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're, they're worshiping Jesus. And part of the prophetic words about the Messiah is that the Messiah will rule the earth. Except the Jews didn't understand that Jesus comes two times. He came first to suffer. He's going to come second to conquer. And so they think he's coming as a conquering king. He's going to rule the world. I mean, think about it. The Jews have had their necks stomped down on by oppressive governments for hundreds of years. And now they're like, our time's come. Finally, God is going to make things right. And so now the disciples are like, okay, we've had this triumphal entry. This is awesome. They think Jesus is about to rule the world as Messiah. Then in the upper room, Jesus says, one of you will betray me. Their life starts to fall apart. What? And then they don't even know who it is. Is it me? Is it me? Like, let that kind of shock you that the fact that Jesus loved Judas so much that no one had any idea that he was the betrayer. So their life starts to fall apart in the upper room. And then Jesus says something like this, where I'm going, you cannot come. Now he's saying, I'm leaving. I'm actually not staying and reigning on a throne. I'm actually leaving. He says, and where I'm going, you cannot come. I'm leaving alone. You're, you are staying here. It shocks him so much that Peter sticks up and he says, Lord, where are you going? And why can I not follow you? I will lay my life down for your sake. That's when Jesus says, oh, really, Peter? Yeah. Right? Don't you know that you're going to, Peter, you don't know this, but actually before the rooster crows, within the next 24 hours, you're going to deny me not once, not twice, but three times. Peter, it really doesn't show how Peter reacts, but you know, like, you know, like, you know when you speak up and you're like, okay, I got something good to say. And then all of a sudden, boom, you get shut down. <laughs> That's a shutdown of shutdowns. I'll go with you. I'll die with you. No, you're going to deny me, actually, three times. Okay. And Peter's one of the leaders of the 12. He's one of the three. Their life is falling apart. I'm actually going. You can't come. Peter, the leader, one of the leaders here, you're going to deny me three times. And Jesus has been warning them. As they get closer and closer to Jerusalem and closer to the cross, he warns them, guys, I have to be arrested and I have to die. This is my... And it's and, and, and Scripture's pretty clear. It kind of goes over the disciples' heads. They don't fully get this and grasp this until Jesus raises again from the dead. So they're not getting... But, but they're like hearing this kind of talk from Jesus. And it's not lining up with the way that they thought God was going to do the thing. You ever experienced that in life where you have this expectation of God, you think he's going to do it one way, and all of a sudden life goes in a completely different direction? Can I just say it's for your good when it happens that way? Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not defending wicked, evil things done to you. God is not the author of evil. But God knows what he's doing. God has a plan. So he's been warning them. And now in the garden, they see their master, their Messiah, and their God troubled deeply. So much so that he's sweating blood and he's crying out to God. This is not the Jesus they're used to seeing. I mean, this is Jesus' humanity at full display. Guys, they're asleep from sorrow because they're overcome. Their lives are falling apart. And now Jesus is going to be betrayed and arrested. Watch this. Luke 22, we'll be in 47 to 53 now. Luke 22, four, verses 47 to 53. 47 says this, And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, 
went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. This is Judas. Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Think about those lines. He doesn't just say me. He says his title. You're betraying the Son of God. You're betraying the Messiah. And you're doing it with a kiss. In fact, here's what blows me away. In another gospel account, Jesus calls Judas friend. Friend, I think it's like, friend, why are you here? Friend, friend what brings you here? Something like this. But he calls Judas friend. Jesus doesn't exaggerate. Okay, Jesus isn't exa exaggerating. Is like, it's basically deceit, right? Embellishing with, you know, with a, a nice, nice fresh coat of paint, making it look pretty. But really, when you're embellishing and you're exaggerating, technically, that's not truth. And Jesus is truth embodied, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And so Jesus would never say anything that he doesn't mean. He literally calls Judas his friend. What does that say about God? Wow. So Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? John adds this. In John 18, verses 4 to 6, John says, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, so he knows what he's about to drink, this cup, right? Knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? I mean, are you kidding me? The absolute courage Jesus had. He walks into the prison and he says, who are you seeking? Right? Like he's like ready to go. He's not fighting it. The courage that Jesus walked in, my goodness. Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas who betrayed him also stood with them. And when he said, now when Jesus said to them, I am he, it says that they drew back and fell to the ground. Can you imagine that? You're coming to arrest a prophet, okay? You're a temple guard. You're, you're arresting this prophet at night. And we're like, hey, we're here to see Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. And the whole party that you're with falls to the ground. And then they get back up and they arrest him. I mean, I don't get that part. <laughs> the dullness. Okay. Okay, back in Luke 22, verse 49 says this. When, the gra so when those around him saw what was going to happen, so the disciples see the writing on the wall. These guys come with torches and clubs. They have handcuffs or ropes or, or, or something to bind Jesus in. They know they're about to, to arrest Jesus. They, they see Judas in the crowd with the bad guys, if you will. They're probably connecting, oh my gosh, Judas is the betrayer. The shock of their life is they're in all of this sorrow. Think about how much is going on in their hearts and their heads right now, and the stress levels. They see the writing on the wall, and they say this to Jesus, Lord. Maybe they even whisper it to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Remember, Jesus just said, hey, guys, there's a new strategy I'm giving you. You need to take your knapsack. You need to take your clothes. No one is going to be friendly to you. No one is going to host you anymore like the Jews did. It's going to be hostile waters from now on. You're going through persecution. And he says, if you don't have a sword, get a sword. And I covered this last week. Here's what Jesus is not saying. He's not saying live a life of, uh, of vengeance or bloodshed, but he is giving them permission to defend themselves. So they, Jesus literally just talked about swords and they're like looking at, you imagine how high the tension is. They're looking at everything unfold and they're like, they're kind of like, look, you know, Peter has a sword, right? He's like grabbing his sword and he's like, Lord, are we supposed to grab the sword now? Is now the time? They're misunderstanding the timing of everything what Jesus was saying. Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Verse 50. And one of them struck the servant of the high priest. This is not funny. I'll, I'll tell you why this is funny. Uh, struck the servant of the high priest. His name is Malchus, by the way. Uh, another, another gospel account gives it. And cuts the right ear off. This is why this is kind of funny. So Mark says the same thing. One of the 12 took their sword and struck this guy Malchus and his ear fell off. John, and by the way, Mark, it's understood by church tradition that Mark was written by John Mark, who was a, um, an assistant to Peter, the apostle, the disciple. And so some people like to point fun at this story and go, hey, it's interesting that Mark goes, oh, it was one of the disciples. And it was probably Peter that told Mark to write that. And then John's account says it was Peter. 
So we have, and so we know this was Peter that knocked this guy's ear off with his sword. Okay, verse 51. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Okay, imagine just the craziness that's unfolding. The guy's ear falls off. Jesus picks up the ear of his enemy and he attaches it back on and heals the guy. The Passion of the Christ does a great job at this scene. And he heals him. Permit even this, and he touched his ear and healed him. Look what John adds here. Uh, John chapter 18, 11 says this. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? This goes to show you that Jesus isn't saying, we're not supposed to act like this and defend ourselves. He's saying, shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? He's saying, Peter, you're getting in the way of the will of my father. Put the sword away. So Jesus rebukes Peter for getting in the way of God's plan, not using the sword. Verse 52. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him. This is a massive crowd. This is the leadership of Israel in the cover of darkness, planning it in such a way where none of the people are around so they can arrest them in secret because they knew what they were doing was wrong. And, and then Jesus says to these leaders, have you come out as against a robber? Guys, am I a robber? Am I a thief? Am I a criminal that you're coming out to me like this? With swords and clubs, he says. 53 says this, When I was with you daily in the temple, you do not even try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. So he's connecting things and he's going, Satan's having his time right now. This is, this is Satan, right? This is your hour, right? And remember, Jesus accused them of having the Father, not as God, but as Satan. Right? Imagine, ima so imagine the spirit realm behind this. Imagine Satan is literally inside of Judas. Satan's probably got his crew around it, right? In the spirit realm. We don't know what it looks like, but we're, this is probably an extremely dark and demonic moment. Right? Matthew, watch this. Matthew adds this. For chapter 26, verse 53, Matthew says, Or do you not think? So Jesus also says this right after. Peter chops the guy's ear off, Malchus's ear off. Jesus, Jesus says this according to Matthew's perspective, or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Okay. Some of you guys didn't just hear what I said. 12 legions of angels. I want to break down the literal power and force behind more than 12 legions of angels. Okay, so let's think, how many is a legion? Roman legions, it's actually debated on a Roman legion because it's not found in writings. Uh, so they have their, their best guess that a Roman legion is between, I've seen numbers as, as small as three and as high as six. Okay, so for easy math, let's just say that 12 legions of angels, let's just call them 5,000 per legion, okay? Plus or minus, but let's easy math. Let's say 5,000 angels per legion. 12 times 5 is 60,000. So Jesus says, Peter, don't you know that I can pray to my Father in heaven and request more than 60,000 angels right now? Now, let's talk about the power of an angel. It took two angels to destroy two entire cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. Two. In fact, in 2 Kings 19.35, it shows an account where one angel killed by himself 185,000 soldiers. One angel, 185,000. So let's, let's play that math out. 185,000 per angel, which is 60,000 angels. That's 11.1 .1 billion people. Guys, we're talking about planet-killing, planet-destructive force that Jesus has at his command. By the way, the population of the human race is 7.8 uh, billion right now. 7.8, yeah. So, and, and it was far smaller back then. I mean, we're talking about massive power that Jesus has at his fingertips. And Jesus said, more than 12 legions. So it was even more than that destructive force. Now consider the scene. Can I just break this down for a second? You have around probably 60,000 angels surrounding Jesus or maybe looking down on the scene from heaven 
every single angel with their hand on their sword waiting for Jesus to give the word. I mean, you probably could hear a pin drop in heaven. And not to, not, you know, let's not forget that what the angels are seeing, they're seeing Satan. They're probably seeing powers and principalities and, and the demonic force, the horde, right? Thinking that they're winning. Satan would have never gone through this if he had known the absolute destruction it would have caused the darkness with Jesus' blood. Okay, so Satan is literally playing into the hands of God, and he has no idea. Imagine the scene of 60, I mean, planet-killing size force of angels ready to go, just waiting for Jesus to say the command. What does that say about the restraint and the self-control Jesus had? Because Jesus was innocent the whole time. Like a lamb being led to, to slaughter, as Scripture says, silent before his accusers. The restraint. I mean, can you, have you ever been in a situation where you know justice is on your side and you can take someone out, right? Whether it's by giving valuable information or, right? Like, and, and there is something in us that wants to see justice, right? And and we're even seeing Peter not flowing in the same restraint as Jesus, right? So like he, he's all he's also, even in that moment with the sword defending themselves, he's displaying and teaching his disciples self-discipline and restraint. Jesus had his own sword that could literally annihilate the entire planet in an instant. And he chose not to draw it. And he was innocent and he had every right to draw that sword. He had every right to unleash the angels on these guys. The restraint and the self-control. Friends, listen to this. Jesus denied the legions for you. He denied the legions for you. And we need to remember this, that Jesus is in full control here. This is important. Jesus is in absolute full control. Jesus did not unwillingly go to the cross. He wasn't excited about it. He asked for another plan, but he said, I'm going to surrender to your will, Father. Jesus was in full control. The soldiers fell to the ground when he said, I am he. He had 60,000 angels at his command that he could have just snapped his fingers. He could have blinked. He could have said the word. He could have fought the word and it would have happened. And when the men arrived to arrest Jesus, consider this. I'll read it again. John 18, 8 says this. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him went forward. He knows what's awaiting him. And, and, and the, he went forward for you guys. He went forward for me. No one has ever gone through what Jesus has gone through for us. I don't know if we'll fully ever contemplate and understand the hardship and the pain and the crushing. He experienced the full wrath of God on the cross and separation. He, he went to hell for you, basically. Jesus knew that he was going to be whipped, tortured, crucified, separated from the Father. And knowing these things, he went forward. He's the, most he's the most courageous person to ever walk the earth. What was his motivation? Obedience to the Father and love for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Consider, now watch this. Let, I want to highlight prayer in the, in the midst of these final moments of Jesus. How much prayer is emphasized here, just from the upper room to right now? I'm going to just, let's just look in the upper room. Luke 22, 31 says, and, he, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. Friends, when you, when you see your own friends under attack, pray for them. The best thing that you can do for your friends under the attack of Satan is to pray for them because this is Jesus' best weapon that he used. So we see Jesus emphasizing prayer when Satan was, uh, when he was warning them that Satan was going to attack him. Jesus emphasized prayer. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke twenty two forty. 40, it says this, when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Verse 41, he knelt down and he prayed. Verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed more. Jesus finds his disciples sleeping, and he says, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Prayer protects us from falling into temptation. 
After Peter cuts a guy's ear off, Jesus tells Peter, or do you not think I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide for me more than 12 legions of angels. Jesus had access to a level of power that, power that could destroy planets. And how did he access that power? Through the power of prayer. I've heard it said this. I've heard it said this way about the garden, that the garden was the greatest battle in Jesus and in, 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 in the entire redemptive story of the cross, of the gospel, of our sins being paid for, of this entire redemptive story, I've heard it said that the garden was the greatest of the battles. That the battle was won in the garden. I actually, I personally believe that. You look at how, like, how weak Jesus was. How he was literally asking for another plan. I mean, like, his disciples were seeing it. They were in sorrow. This was the greatest battle. Jesus was in such distress that he sweat blood. And he was in so much distress that the Lord had to send an angel to strengthen him. Jesus navigated one of, if not the greatest of his trials, he navigated through prayer. How did Jesus prepare for the cross? Through prayer. How did he navigate being betrayed by his one of his closest friends? Through prayer. Friends, we need to remember how important prayer is. We need to remember. Now Jesus is arrested. And look what Matthew adds here. And we're just about to finish up. Matthew chapter 26, verse 57 says this, and it's the back end of verse 57. So Jesus is arrested and it says, Then all, not some, all the disciples forsook him and fled. Forsook means to abandon. So Jesus is in the greatest trial, the greatest battle of his life, and now he's alone. He's been, he's been, a, a, he's been abandoned by his closest friends. Who literally, one of them just said, I'll go with you, I'll die with you, and Peter bounces. It was hard enough that Jesus was in anguish. It's hard enough that he was sweating blood. It was hard enough that he was in such anguish and distress that an angel had to be sent to strengthen him. Now Jesus is betrayed by one of his closest friends, and now the other 11 of his friends have abandoned him. This is a dark moment. And he did it for you. He did it for you. In fact, Scripture's clear. It says that while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. While we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. In fact, it was your sins that put him on that cross. It was my sins that put him on that cross. He would never have to have gone through that if we didn't drop the ball. Starting from Adam all the way to now. And now he's going to go through fake and false trials by his own people, the people of God that, he, that God has called to be his own people, by his own people. He's going to be given up to the Gentiles. In, one, in, in literally within the span of hours, of days, the people are going to go from Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, calling Jesus Messiah and King. They're going to go from there to crucify him. We should, we should never become desensitized to the price that Jesus paid for us in the garden and on the cross. I'm going to stop there for today. Let me close this in prayer. And then we can jump into a testimony. Lord, I just Lord, I just feel the weight, Lord God, of the price that you've paid, Lord, and the heaviness, Lord. And Lord, right now we just pray, Lord, let your sacrifice shock us. Let your sacrifice touch us right now in a deep way. Let us recognize the price that you've paid. Let us recognize the severity of our sins. And bring us to a place of repentance, a repentant lifestyle. Lord, we are sorry. We repent for our sins, Lord God. We repent for living the life that we've lived, Lord God, and, and, and living in rebellion and putting you on the cross. 
Jesus, we thank you. You're the most courageous man that has ever walked the earth. You did it, Lord God, alone. It was just you and it was just you, the Father and the Holy Spirit. Your, your closest friends abandoned you. Your own people are going to abandon you. We just thank you, Jesus, for what you went through for us. Let us never become desensitized. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to just give an opportunity for people to respond. Maybe you've never said yes to Jesus before. Maybe, maybe you have said yes to Jesus, but you've gone into a prodigal season and you've kind of turned your back on God and you want to reset with Jesus. I want to give people an opportunity to do that. That's, that also includes people online. And maybe you're watching online at a, at a later date at a recording. You can still participate. If that's you, if you're like, I want to say yes to Jesus for the first time, or I want to say yes to Jesus again, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you can raise your hand. And when you raise your hand, you can put it back down. And then we can pray corporately as a body. So if that's you, if you're like, that's me, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit move me to say yes. Go ahead and just quietly and quickly raise your hand. If you're online and, and you want to say yes, you can reach out to us on one of the platforms that you're watching. Maybe you have a phone number of someone that goes to this church. We want to walk with you through this process of saying yes to Jesus. And let me stress this, friends. When you say yes to Jesus, you say yes to everything. You can't just be a Christian in name only. Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. It's a life of surrender. You can't just say that you're a believer and not look like it. You have to act like it. Um, with that being said, we also want to pray, Lord, for everybody that we know, family, friends, acquaintances, co-workers, for people that don't know you or not fully walking in your will. We just And Lord, even for us, if we're not fully walking in your will, Lord, we just pray, Lord, rescue us. Lord, save us. Save our friends and our family. Use us however you want to use us. We just pray for salvation to come, for redemption to come. Uh, Lord, that uh, for healing to come. We just pray for families right now that you would heal families, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for positioning, that you would position each and every one of us and those that we know and love, Lord God, position each and every one of us, Lord God, to be in your perfect will. We love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. Well, come on up, Parker. We got Parker today to give Woo! his testimony. Awesome. Okay, so Josh and I, every Monday night, we go play basketball at this church right up on the north side. And anyways, it was about, I say it was probably like three weeks ago, there was this guy wearing like a knee brace, and we were playing basketball with him, and then we like sat down like between games, and he was talking to this guy like next to me, and he was just complaining the whole time about like how bad his knee hurts. And I was kind of like smiling to myself, and I was like, cool, like this is such an awesome opportunity to like, just like pray for him. <laughs> Literally, I was like so excited, which it's, I wasn't excited as he was hurt, but I was excited to show the power of Jesus to him. Um, and so as soon as he stopped talking to the guy, I was like, hey, like I heard you talking about your knee. Like what happened to it? Like what's going on? And he's like, it was something, I don't know if it was like a, it was a torn ligament of some sort. I don't know what it was, but he got surgery on it and it's just like hurting. And so I was like, okay, let me pray for it. And so I prayed for his knee and I just asked that God would heal his knee and even like lead him to a deeper revelation of who Jesus is. And that was really the extent of it. Um, didn't, I didn't really like ask him if it was feeling better or anything. That was just, that was that. And then next week he was at basketball again. And he's like, dude, I just wanted to come up and say, thank you for praying over my knee. Like I was so encouraged. Like, I went home and told my wife about this super cool guy that wanted to like, pray for my knee and talk to me about Jesus. And then he's like, and also, and he like, he like got less excited because I think of how like big it was for him. He's like, my knee hasn't hurt once. And it was like, cool. It was like super touching to his heart. It was so amazing. He's like, it hasn't hurt one time. And it was awesome. And I talked to him about the Lord more than, and I encouraged him. And I told him, I was like, well, thank you so much for like letting me pray for you. And like, we just talked about Jesus and it was awesome. And then last Monday I saw him again and he didn't have a knee brace on anymore. And so the first time I saw him, he had a knee brace on. And then the second time he had a knee brace, but no pain. And then the third time there was no knee brace whatsoever on his knee, like just fully healed like i guess it was just it was amazing i'd never seen that and to see like the progression is like there was like 
power in it. Like it was so cool to see God like heal him. And then like for myself, like what I got out of it, it was awesome because so often I think like, oh, if I had like a platform, I'd be able to like reach more people or tell more people about Jesus. But it's like if we just live a life for the Lord, like he's going to like, I mean, there's so much darkness in the world and it's a hurting world. And so like we just have this opportunity to just share Jesus everywhere we go. And it was so cool. I was like, I was literally just at basketball with Josh, just playing with some dudes. And there's a, some guy with a hurting knee and God healed his knee supernaturally. It was just so amazing. But yeah, it's awesome. It was Woo. so good. Praise God. Give God a hand. Yeah. Thank you, Parker. Yeah. Um, you know, if I could just add on to that, God, God heals believers and non-believers, right? And so for the non-believers, obviously, let's point them to Christ. Let's let's make sure they're getting connected and, and invite them to your church. If they if they have a church that they stop going to, encourage them to go back and get plugged in. But if it's a believer that experiences the power of God, um, what I my, my, my style is this. Hey, let this be part of your testimony. Tell people now that God heals. And let this embolden you and give you courage to lay hands on other people that are sick and pray for them and to point them to Jesus. Um, so just a, a fun fun tip to offer. Um, man, God is good. Yeah, He heals today. Yeah. Just like He did yesterday, He's healing today. Um, and yeah, let this just be an encouragement to you that, I mean, think about, let's just walk through Parker's uh, what Parker did in all this. He heard a need, he prayed for the need, and he trusted God with the results. It's that simple. And God showed up. And so let that be an encouragement for you. All you got to do is just say, hey, I'm just, I'm just right now, I'm, I, sometimes you can even just play the, I'm new at this card. Hey, I'm just trying to practice like wanting to pray for people more. Can I just pray for your knee or your hip or whatever it is? And, uh, and then explain that, you know, sometimes God heals immediately and sometimes God heals fast, but over a, a period of time. Um, with that being said, I want to just thank everybody.